Hi, hello. <laughs> My name is Paul Kinlan. I'm a developer advocate at Google. I'm based in London. Uh, I work on Chrome, HTML5, uh, web apps in general, uh, and the Chrome Web Store. And so today, I mean, we've got a couple of things that are going to happen. Um, we're going to, I'm actually going to talk about building kind of great web applications. So uh, who was in the HTML5 talk? Was pretty much everyone in there? Was good? Yeah, it's cool. So pretty much everything that applies in that talk will apply in this talk, but we're going to try and talk about how you can get more users and uh, then use the web store. And we're going to try and show you how to upload a web application to the web store um, so that when it launches, you can get a lot of users and you know get great discovery for your application, basically. Um, so let's start like 1997. So this is about the time when I was first allowed on the internet by my parents. You know, they allowed me to have a modem and they agreed to actually pay for the, the telephone calls. Um, and like most people, my first experience of web applications was, you know, it wasn't great. You know, the, you know, our connections weren't great. They weren't quick. Uh, the applications and the technologies didn't exist uh, to have like really rich kind of user experiences. Um, that we kind of expect from web applications today. Um, but we did have web applications on the web round about then. We had, uh, this is actually Hotmail. Um, this was a great, app, this is a great app, like, example of one of those first applications that you see on the web, which makes you realize that actually the web is a great application platform because no longer do you need to carry all your mails around with you. You can just access them on any device anywhere in the world, uh, pretty much any time. But if you compare them to web applications, you know, the desktop applications, sorry, they kind of de the desktop applications, even back in 1997, were actually pretty rich. You could do word processing, desktop publishing, uh, graphic and image manipulation. You know, but you could never do any of these on the web. These tools just didn't exist on the web. Um, but the, the bad thing, the, what I consider a bad thing about these type of applications is that pretty much everything was stored on the local machine. If you wanted to transfer data between the machines, you normally put them onto a disk or maybe a CD if you could uh, afford a CD writer at the time. Um, essentially, if you wanted to take your emails with you, you could use Pop, I suppose, but you know, you look at this type of application, you have to take it with you, basically, to actually get access. And even back then, you know, I remember people talking about, you know, what is the future of applications, and you know, we, we had this argument of, you know, is web better, you know, these web applications, um, are they better, or desktop applications? We didn't have an answer then, but Definitely web applications, you know, you could start to see the benefits of the cloud, this kind of, you know, it's like, syn like availability and synchronization. Um, but the applications didn't compare to their desktop, app like, their, like their comparative desktop applications. So they didn't have like the richness and expressiveness, you know, you couldn't do advanced graphics or you couldn't even do drag and drop in most of these um, web applications. And these were things that developers or users uh, expected from applications. Um, if you fast forward a couple of years, we kind of got the start of, you know, we got Ajax, you know. Microsoft, they probably introduced Ajax with, uh, I think it was Outlook Web Access, I think it was. Um, but we started to have this kind of all-in-one experience for applications. So if you take, say, Google Maps as an example, um, you know, you'd never get around the world, never leave the page. And you had this kind of like tight, tightly defined, cohesive application experience. If you compare this to, like, to, to traditional mapping software at the time, you would press north. You know, if you were lucky, the image would reload. But quite often, the whole browser would reload. You'd be taken out of the kind of app experience while all the data kind of got pulled back into your page and then displayed the, the update to the map. Um, and if you fast forward again, a lot of the things that we learned with Ajax and some of the things that we wanted, uh, things like offline support, uh, database support, uh, even threads, you know, we had to have plugins. You had to use something like Google Gears to actually be able to, you know, achieve some of the kind of same functionality that we saw uh, on desktop applications. And if you combine all the technologies in HTML5, we're kind of starting to get to that point where we can create these really rich kind of immersive experiences. And hopefully, that's what I'm going to talk about today. So where we are now is that, in my eyes at least, you know, these web applications. They combine everything, you know, the com like the richness of the desktop applications now. So we can do a lot of things like drag and drop, you know, advanced graphics. But they also support, you know, the benefits that we saw in 1997 about kind of synchronization in the cloud and, you know, just being able to access your data from pretty much any device anywhere. So I actually speak to quite a lot of people um, about the difference between web applications and websites. And 
it's actually really hard to kind of it's actually really hard to quantify you know what a web application is and how it differs from a website but we've got a I've got a couple of examples and I'm going to test you all to see whether we kind of get consensus basically so do we think this is a web application website yeah so I definitely think Wikipedia is a website it's content based um, you use it for exploration of information um, but primarily it's just content based Wikimap here do we think that's a website web app do we all think it's web app cool yeah so I think this is a web application uh, it's it's built on the same content that, that Wikipedia is built on um, but it provides like functionality and allows the user to actually achieve something um, and in this case it's actually finding like Wikipedia articles around where you're actually currently based web app website in the middle yeah so I actually think that's about right so when I speak to people about what is this is it a website is Twitter a website or is it a web application I think it depends how you look at it so if I wasn't logged into Twitter and I was just consuming information it's probably like a website it's like Wikipedia um, you can't really do much with it but as soon as you log in you get all this functionality exposed and you can use it as a communication tool and the fact that for me it's a tool probably puts it in more of the kind of the web application um, kind of area do we need to ask do you think it's a website cool yeah so this is a great application of a web application a well, great application did I say a application it's a great example of a web application um, you know it's an email tool it, it works really well as an example because there is a direct comparison to a desktop application which is like Outlook or you know your Pegasus mail and those type of applications um, so if we look back across the, the three applications at least you'll find that most of them have like some special properties they're task orientated which means that their designs are kind of achieve, let, let you achieve a goal basically in the case of email it's to communicate and send emails basically with the case of Twitter you know it's again it's a communication tool um, and Wikimap here is a is a great kind of discovery tool they have quite tight focuses so if we kind of go back you know it's it's not actually that distracting you know, the Gmail interface it just lets you read emails and you know consume emails and write emails it doesn't have a lot of extra functionality which detracts you from actually achieving your goal pardon me and they also have really rich user experiences and what we mean by kind of rich user experiences is you know they th old web apps used to take you out of that whole application field every time you refresh the page a lot of these applications now they don't take you out of this application field they keep you inside it they let you actually achieve your goal uh, the task that you want to do quickly and I think that's what makes a great user experience is things don't get in the way to stop you to uh, let you complete what you need to do um, but these applications don't have to be uh, you know, amazingly complex uh, this is just a simple application I think it's mug tug darkroom uh, if you search Google for it you'll get to use it and it's a great example of kind of all those three principles it has a really tight focus um, you know it, it doesn't tend to do things it's not going to do you know it's all it is is an image manipulation and drawing tool um, it's got a great user experience because you know it's all interactive you know you can flick between the tabs you know each of the tabs are tightly contained they have the information that help you you know they have the tools available to help you do what you need to do in this in this application basically uh, it's just a nice little application another great one has everyone have you seen this it's a really great tool it, it actually doesn't work in my browser at the moment so I was going to give you a nice little demo and it's going to be really cool um, but every time zone is really cool it's if you've ever tried to arrange meetings across time zones or in multiple cities you just know it's a right it's a right pain to try and do uh, this is just a nice way of visualizing the different time zones in different cities that you're interested in um, it's not amazingly complex but the way they built it just helps you you know schedule these meetings it's just really nice and it's all plain HTML JavaScript CSS it's really cool um, so that's kind of I hope um, that I've kind of showing you some of the ideas of like at least what a web application is or what my thoughts are about web applications um, some kind of practical tips to actually help you build some rich user experiences so you might be developing an application now um, but you want to make sure that you get lots of users and the users really like your applications um, so we've got this idea of the biggest one for me right is is this idea of lazy registration so I've built web applications in the past and the first thing that I do is I I ask for a username and password and 
I asked the user to create a, like, an account on my site or my application. And that's actually the biggest thing to, that stops users from using your application if they have to fill out yet another form or you know, create another account. Lazy registration, or at least the idea, the principle behind lazy registration, is that you let the user use the application before asking them for a username and password. Uh, it's not amazingly hard to do. Um, it just kind of inverts the way that we normally develop applications. But what you'll find is that users who invest time in your application um, are more likely to actually stay on your application because, you know, they've, say they've drawn an image. They don't want to lose that image. You ask them for an account when they come to like, create an account. When they come to save that image, uh, they're more likely to do it because they've spent time actually using your application. And, oh, sorry, a great, app, like a great example of this is Avery Vector Editor. So, um, I'll tell you what, I'll reload it. Uh, kind of screen size changed. So this is an application. It's actually a Flash-based application. I'm not kind of picky whether you build web applications in HTML or Flash or, you know, Silverlight or those type of technologies. Um, but its principle is actually pretty cool because you basically you start using the application as soon as it loads. So you'll draw. Oh, I'm actually pretty rubbish to put this on the Mac. Yeah, there we go. So we start drawing. You know, I think that's like the world's best image. It's brilliant. So I want to save it. Um, you know, and that's when it asks me for the account. Uh, you know, it's it's just a nice way of actually getting users to use your application because that's the biggest hurdle for any kind of web application. Uh, yeah, I think it explains itself in a way. Um, kind of following on for this is is another very similar concept that I think some people call transparent registration. And the idea behind this is actually sometimes it's not possible to, um, you know let users use your application without them creating an account first. Um, so what you actually want to do is you need to use like, technologies which you know, put the, as few barriers in the way as possible for actually creating that account. So one of the hard things for users is choosing usernames and finding usernames. And technologies like OpenID um, can actually help with that. And it's especially important for kind of the context of the Chrome Web Store at least because, you know, you can pretty much rely on the fact that users using the store will probably be signed in with Gmail. Uh, so essentially what happens is the user will use your application for the first time. You'll direct them through the flow. They will potentially be logged in already. Uh, you can get the user ID token to, like, that's the token that you use to actually create the account on your system. Um, and then you just let the user use the application. If, if they're logged into Gmail or their OpenID provider, normally they won't actually have to sign in. It just looks like they've started to use the application. And I do have a good example. So this is where this one fails. So this is diary.com. There we go. So I was actually, I didn't have an account created. Um, so I didn't have an account created previously. I just went through the open ID flow and it logged me in. It's just a nice example of not having to actually create, ask the user to create an account to actually use your system. Uh, to use your system. Uh, and it actually works really well. Uh, we also have this idea of automatic persistence, and the idea behind automatic persistence is, ver is like very similar to what Google Docs does, is that the kind of save button is like an anti-pattern, um, because people never press it, so you always have like an automatic save, and you know, people hate save buttons, but the great thing about automatic persistence, and we're starting to see this with mobile devices, is that you'll go into the application, use it, shut it down, you know, press the home button or whatever, uh, load it back up, and the data is still there. We can do that on the web. Um, there's kind of, it takes a little bit of work to do. It's not, it's not the easiest way of doing things, but there's a lot of kind of technologies like Web SQL Database, which I think Jeremy talked about earlier, which you can use to, to help you build this. But we have some great examples. So this is, um, this is actually Etherpad. I believe, did Google buy these people? I'm not sure, but, um, so you just type in, you know. The thing about this is that every time I type, it saves. So not only is it good for kind of, reloading the data back up, so I'll just refresh the page. It kind of simulating a browser crash. If I, my browser crashes, I can just go back into it. I don't have to worry about it. But the great thing is, and this is the great thing about cloud applications or uh, applications where the, the data stores in the cloud at least, is that you can go to another machine and still get the same content and not actually have to synchronize it because it's done automatically. Uh, it's just really powerful and really nice. One of the things as well, so I speak to, I speak to a lot of application developers. And this is a really bad example of what I'm trying to <laughs> talk about because uh, it looks pretty horrible. Um, but they say that you can't do animations on the web. Um, 
And traditionally, they've been right. You know, if you, would do, if you used to, even up until fairly recently, if you wanted to do animations, you would use something like jQuery and like animate JavaScript properties. But you could only do certain things that the browser would let you do, like maybe like move it from the top left to the top right. It was really hard to do things like scales and rotations. Uh, and then it was even harder to do them if you applied kind of custom fonts, web fonts. Um, so when we talk to actually like desktop developers, They've said that we can never do these things. And actually, you can build really nice user experiences, uh, like using like rich interact, like nice animations, and you just make the you make the application feel nicer rather than being kind of Yankee and you know everything happens instantaneously. Um, the thing about this is everything in this page is done in CSS. There's no code at all. So the fonts are web fonts uh, from Google Code, uh, the, the the Google Font API. Has anyone used that? couple of people. So if you want to, right, you've got a couple of options for fonts on the web. So you can actually download fonts into the browser, make really nice looking applications. You can use things like uh, Typekit, which are like commercially licensed fonts, uh, which are cool. Um, but we also have like an open source font repository uh, on the Google Font API. Um, if you just type Google Font API into Google, um, it'll come up with it straight away. But we give you these fonts for free. We let them use, you know, we let you use these in the applications and you can make some you, know, you can really make a great difference to your application. And uh, in the last talk today, Mike Mahamoff has got uh, some really nice examples of just pure like web fonts. It's really cool. But ag again, sorry, I digress. This is just everything CSS. The animation is using essentially some keyframes with some names. If the browser doesn't support animations, it'll just stay static. Like likewise with the fonts. If we don't support web fonts, um, the fonts won't be there. But the whole thing about this is that we, we're doing a whole lot of things like this background gradient, kind of in the old days, you would have to draw an image, have that hosted on your server. Uh, kind of the user experience for, I suppose, the application, it, it's not a bad user experience if you have a gradient, but what will happen is you'll make an extra web request. The application will take longer to start. You know, it just won't look as kind of cohesive. Uh, this is all just CSS, this gradient. So it's really fast. You know, it's really quick. And again, if the browser doesn't support it, you can just go to a plain, um, plain background. Things like the border shadow and the border radius, you know, you always used to have to use like hacks to get them. Shadows, you used to have to use images. Border, the border radius, the, the corners, you know, you used to have to use div hacks. It was horrible trying to do border radiuses, or you used to have to use like custom images. It was really hard. But this is all just CSS, and it's just a nice way of actually saying that, you know, web applications can look really nice, and you don't have to actually have to actually use any code. Um, did Jeremy talk about desktop drag and drop? Yeah, so like drag and drops are really powerful. Uh, it's one of those things that you've always been able to do on desktop applications, but never really on the web. Um, so I rephrase actually. So you've all, you can you can do drag and drop on the web. You can drag elements from one side of the screen to the other and have like a nice experience inside the application. But getting data to and from the application um, has always been quite hard. So in this case, we have a drop handler. If we take a file from the kind of outside world, the desktop drop it onto the page, this drop handler fire, fires, uh, we get the list of files, and then we can use the file reader API that was relatively new to Chrome uh, and some of the later web browsers like Safari as well uh, to actually get access to the file. It's really powerful because you, know, you can actually do file processing on the, in, on the client inside JavaScript. And there are a whole load more kind of APIs coming out for the file system APIs to allow you to actually interact with these files a lot easier. Um, but I've actually got quite a nice demo for um, can show how powerful it is. So this is just an image. We're going to drag it onto the to this. You know, so it's a nice it's a nice demo basically. It's all canvas based. There's been no server interaction. But the really cool thing is, so what what this canvas does is it just inspects every kind of pixel inside the inside the PNG file, and then works out the pixel intensity, the like the brightness of the color, and then just does some weird 3D stuff with it. But it's a really nice example. In the past, you would normally have to upload this to a server, and then the server would have to somehow you know, get it to you. This has all been done client-side. And the fact that we can do this client-side means you can build some really cool applications with it. Um, we also have the ability to drag to the desktop. Um, it's pretty simple, but the, the great use case for this was you know, email clients, if you have a, an attachment in like Outlook, for years and years and years, you've always been able to take that attachment and just drop it on the desktop. Uh, you can do the same thing now. So this is actually a div. It's not an image or anything. Just drop it on the desktop, it downloads it, and hey, it's available. Um, so you can do some kind of 
it allows you to do th basically what I'm trying to say is this allows you to to build rich applications on the web with functionality that people expect from desktop applications. Um, it's really powerful. Again, you know, notifications. I won't go too much into this one, but notifications from an application perspective are a really great way with engaging users if they're not if they're not actually on your page but they have it open. Um, so, so I think we're having some beers at the end of this. So you know, if you want to join me, that'd be cool. But you know, it's these applications like you know these like kind of tweet deck applications have always had these on the desktop where they've you know they've told you something that's happened you know new replies new direct messages and they've actually drove like driven the user back into the application we've not been able to do that on the web we've been able to change like the fav icon or update the you know the, the title bar but we've never been able to actually go you know hello you know you know more information is available and we can do that now and the great actually the great thing about this even though this web this is webkit there's a standard that basically Mozilla and everyone are working on, which will mean that this will work cross browser soon. Um, so I'm getting towards the end of kind of how to build some of these kind of awesome applications. If you're building web applications, who's, who's building web applications at the moment? Quite a few bit, cool. So when, I, when I'm building my web applications, I always use AppCache. Just, so the thing about AppCache, right, is you know, we, we still haven't got this case, even today now, sometimes the network connection goes down. And, you know, if the network connection goes down and we're not offline enabled, you know, our applications are absolutely useless. Uh, AppCache is a great way of just making sure that all the assets that you need, the JavaScript, the CSS, the images, and the HTML, are always available to your application. Uh, it's really simple to get started. You start with a manifest file, which just is basically a list of files. And then the browser will download that and then make sure that they're available uh, to use pretty much whenever. Uh, it's actually really good for actual speeding up your actual site as well, I've found. So you can do things like include some kind of, uh, maybe about 10 resources which are all like commonly used and uh, but hardly ever change. Uh, the browser just is like a really strong cache and it doesn't use the normal caching mechanisms that we expect from websites. Um, background processing, I didn't really touch on this, but we've got web workers now which are essentially threads. The thing about JavaScript and web, you know, uh, web browsers at the moment is it's relatively single threaded. You can pretty much only do one thing at a time. So if you do anything complex in JavaScript, which even only takes maybe 30 milliseconds to complete, you know, it locks up the browser for the user. The user doesn't like that, and you know, if they don't like something, they probably won't use your application. If you have anything which is even relatively complex, uh, modern web browsers now have this idea of web workers or shared web workers for communication. But basically, you just send it some data. It does it on a, like a different thread, and then when it's complete, it can send a message back to your application. And the great thing is, for even from a web worker, you can still access the databases at the same time. So you can actually store information you know, as you go. It's a really powerful way to make really, like, you know, applications feel like they run really quickly. And one of the big things, and we're starting to see this now, and it kind of, I think in the public at least anyway, it started with like IE9 when they said, we're just going to hardware accelerate everything. So pretty much every DOM element, uh, Canvas, you know, we're going we're to take advantage of the GPU, because most of these web applications are graphically rich. Um, you know, we can take advantage of the, these uh, really powerful pieces of hardware inside the machine. Um, so like, everyone's starting to do this now. So all the browser vendors are starting to build, you know, build in hardware acceleration built in. And that allows us to do, you know, I'm not saying use 3D in all your applications, because it's not going to work. <laughs> it's going to probably be a bit rubbish. But we have the ability to use WebGL or like, 3D transformations or CD CSS 3D transformations. Um, these are hardware accelerators. They look really cool and work you know, really quickly. Uh, everyone's starting to like, hardware accelerate canvas animation, or canvas at least, so that if you do any kind of rotations and kind of blitting of images in canvas, you know, they're going to be really quick. And Microsoft have got some really good demos of, that show the difference of between a hardware accelerator browser and a non-hardware accelerator browser. Um, and they're all mainly built in canvas. They show you the, kind of the, the difference it makes, and it does make a lot of difference. But the great thing is, with all this, you don't actually have to do anything. You know, if the, hard, if the browser's got hardware except like, you know, a really decent GPU, um, you know, we'll just take advantage of it straight away. You don't have to do, like, you don't have to be a 3D expert. You don't have to kind of detect 3D. Uh, you don't have to do anything special. Uh, and especially in the case of CSS, if, if your browser doesn't support the 3D, CSS 3D, it just falls back to plain 2D. So. The theory is now that you know, you're building these great applications, and what, you, what you've done with your application is you know, it's cool, you put it on the web, but you want to get lots of users because an app without users, you know, you probably, you've probably wasted a little bit of time developing it. In most cases, you might actually like it yourself. 
But we'll start with from the user perspective. So users actually find it really hard to find applications. And if you look at kind of the, say the iPhone and the Android model, they, you know, they've got a dedicated direct access to applications. We don't have that on the web. You go to a search engine. You as a user go to a search engine. You'll search for an app. You know, if you type chess in, th so the great example is chess, right? Um, the, first exa the first result is chess.com. The thing about chess.com is you don't actually know, you know whether it's an app, how good it is, you know, exactly what, you know, you don't have any reviews. So what you'll do is you'll go and maybe search for reviews to find if it's any good. Uh, then they'll might have a, like a little sign up box, which means you have to sign in and you go, oh, I don't want to sign in. Um, all those type of things. Just finding applications on the web is really, 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 really hard. Um, and if you look at your iPhone, it's dead easy. <laughs> um, but as us as developers, when we develop applications as well, so what we like doing is we like to build the app, we like to release it, you know, get a couple of users. Um, you know, once we've got a couple of users, we'll you know, get their feedback, you know, improve the application, and just go around in this cycle of, you know, getting more users, improving the application. But in practice, it just it doesn't work that way. What you actually have to do is it's a nightmare. So you'll build your application. You'll hire a marketing manager. They'll do the press release. You know, they'll also manage AdWords campaigns and all those other type, types of things. You know, what the thing that everyone does, I don't know whether it's, it's, U, I don't know if it's a UK or US thing. I don't know. But everyone always tries to get on TechCrunch. So the email tips at TechCrunch or whatever it is. They'll try and get on TechCrunch. Then email a lot of other blogs. And, you know, all of this kind of managing kind of your positioning like the search engine rankings to try and be found detracts you from actually building great applications and getting users. Um, it just takes up so much time. And I've fallen into this trap before now. It's, you know, I built an app and it just, you know, it, it actually became quite popular by fluke. Um, but it, I was going to start, you know, if it didn't get popular, I was going to start AdWords campaigns and a whole load of marketing. And, you know, while I was doing that, it was just me developing the application. Um, I wouldn't have been able to get users and improve the application, basically. It's, it's, it's a nightmare. Also, making money is really hard. So I've actually got a little story about this. And the kind of thing is that, we as web, like web developers, we fall into this trap of, you know, Google AdSense is really easy to integrate inside your application. So what you'll do is you'll, you'll build your application, you want to try and make some money, so you'll just drop some advertising in it. And, you know, it, it actually works relatively well. And kind of, from my point of view, so I had a web application, which became, it, it became quite popular. Um, it was hosted on the App Engine, so while it wasn't popular, it was free to run and that was fine. But as it got really popular, um, I had to start paying, and then it got even more popular. Um, and my, I think my daily bill was about, about $8 a day on the App Engine, which is probably quite expensive, uh, just for one website. Um, so I had to try and cover the cost somehow, so I did what everyone does, dropped advertising on it. It, it worked quite well, it kind of covered the costs, basically, but you know, once I was starting to make money, I actually was thinking, well, actually, I could probably try and make a living out of this. Um, but it was like adverts were never gonna do it. So I went down the whole kind of freemium model, so, I thought about how I wanted to make some money. So I thought, well, users will pay for, you know, they wanted it to run, for, it, was, it, it was a Twitter app, basically. Um, but they would pay for it to go faster or if it had more features. Um, so I, I did what everyone does. We, we go to kind of like uh, all the, the payment integration APIs. We look at their APIs and we go, oh man, there's so much work to do. Integrating with Google Checkout is, it's, it's actually not too hard to do, but you know, you have to integrate it with, you have to build a billing API and a payment API on your side and payment processing systems. And then you have to integrate with like fraud detection systems. And it's, <laughs> it's actually a lot of work. So I estimated about maybe two or three weeks worth of work uh, before I could even start making money. Um, but actually on Google Checkout and actually PayPal as well, they have this little iframe embed kind of buy it now button, um, which basically a user will press buy and then they will go through PayPal or Google Checkout. And then you'll get sent an email saying that this person bought it. You know, you've got to send them the goods, essentially. So I just did that because it was like 10 minutes worth of work. And I uploaded the app. And I think within about 10 minutes, I had about five paying customers. And then it just rolled on from there. It was, like, it was actually pretty good in the end. But kind of the, the, I suppose that the moral of the story is that I found out you know, it was a confidence issue, right? So I didn't think anyone would actually pay for my application. But actually, if your application is actually pretty good, users will pay for it. And we're not asking users to pay, you know, hundreds of dollars a month or hundreds of, hundreds of dollars a year. Normally it's like $5 a month essentially. Um, but you've got to kind of get the confidence to actually say, hey, I can actually charge for this and we can still get quite, quite a lot of users and users who are willing to pay for it as well. And there are a lot of people who are actually willing to pay for these things. 
And I actually think we've seen this from, say, the Android and Apple app stores. Um, you know, people are willing to pay for applications if they're good. Um, but for me, it was hard. Yeah, it was definitely hard for me to ask people to pay. But it was also hard to integrate the app. So it was like two or three weeks worth of work. And in that two or three weeks, I wouldn't have been making any money, and I might have lost focus. And yeah, it's crazy. But at least so. So I joined Google in February, um, and in May we announced uh, the Chrome Web Store at Google I/O. And the idea behind the Web Store, at least, is at least for me, is that it makes all the things that we were talking about before, which were really complex or really hard, uh, quite simple. You know, the idea that you know users find it hard to find that. Users find it hard to find applications. Uh, you know, they go to search engines and you, find it, you know, you can't get reviews and ratings and see the applications and all that type of stuff. You know, we're building this into the web store, so it's going to be super easy for users to actually find applications. So we're going to have kind of the things that we expect from these type of stores. We're going to have uh, ratings and reviews. So each application, you can rate and review and you know, see all the user comments and feedback. Um, but users can actually find applications uh, through kind of natural search. Uh, so it's like a, it's basically an application vertical search. Um, and then we also have categories, so you as a developer can list your application in different categories. Uh, and then users can actually explore, kind of window shop those applications uh, just through the, the bit there, essentially. Um, but the really cool thing is that we're also integrating payments directly into the whole process, so that users will be able to install the application directly from the web store, but they'll also be taken through a payment flow. And the idea from the payment flow, and we'll talk about this in a minute actually, is that it's like zero touch from the user and it's zero touch from a developer so that you don't actually have to do any work to start taking payments. The great thing as well is from a developer point of view, the Chrome Web Store is going to be built into, I've got a demo, like a little thing here. It's essentially going to be built into every new tab page. So the application is going to be installed here and the Web Store is going to be accessible. And again, it's following that kind of same model of just making it easy for the users to be able to you know, start to find applications. Uh, this will be built into pretty much every new tab page. But if you combine the fact that we're installing the web store into every new tab page, um, and you combine that with the, the number of users that we're getting and the kind of the growth curve, you know, we actually can, in this case in May, it was over 70 million users. You know, that's over 70 million users who will be able to actually start to find applications and will have a dedicated store built into their browser. So it's, like a, it's a really powerful way to actually start to find users. It's really cool. Um, you know, we said we want to make it easy for users to buy applications. Uh, it would be silly if we didn't make it really easy for developers to sell applications. In this case, we can, it's just a configuration option, essentially. So we have the, you, know, you can have your application for free. You can monetize it through ad, like adverts. Um, or if you just want to give it away for free, that's fine. You can do that. Um, it's not a problem. Uh, you can also use the Chrome Web Store payment integrated payment solution. And essentially what this allows you to do is take one-time payments up front at, at install time. Uh, but we also help you know help you with subscriptions and recurring payments, which if we go back to the kind of the, the kind of the, the payment API processing systems, doing recurring payments is really hard. If you ever try and do recurring has anyone ever used a credit card, a proper credit card merchant account? Three, four, five, cool. It's hard sometimes. Uh, if you're actually a business and you want to start taking recurring payments, you have to have massive. You have to have a lot of security systems in place. They don't trust you with the credit card details to actually be able to kind of repeat bill. The idea behind the web store is that we'll support monthly and annual subscriptions straight away. Again, this is kind of with no no code or integration from you basically. Um, but you know we don't want to we don't want to force you to use our you know the thing about the web right is. It's inclusive of, it should be inclusive of every browser. Uh, that means you can develop HTML and it'll work across everything. And likewise with payment solutions as well. You know, you might already have PayPal or Google Checkout built, you know, built into your application. You might already have your own credit card merchant account. Now we still want you to list those applications in the store. The only difference is it's not going to be a, like a one-click integrated install process, essentially. Uh, you have to use, you know, basically the user will install the application, it will be installed into their browser and then the tab page. The user will run the application for the first time and then be prompted to pay or upgrade or whatever because that's what you need to ask. Um, so yeah, we want to support every way that you can kind of make money. You know, you can do it through the store. Um, so the quick question is, you know, how to you get your application into the store? And the good thing is, uh, so who was in the extension store today? 
then we're in our extensions of a couple of people. Right, so build, when you build a Chrome extension, uh, it, their HTML, JavaScript, and CSS, uh, nothing amazingly kind of complex. We have a manifest file, which is essentially this. And if we take kind of, so if you ignore this bottom section, I nearly just broke that then. If you take this bottom section, uh, remove it away, it's a Chrome extension. If you add this app section in here, that's what makes it an application, and that's all that you have to do. You basically give give the manifest file, you know, the URL of where you're going to launch. And I've actually not included it because I didn't have enough space when I first did these slides. But you can also tell the you, know, you can also tell Chrome how to launch your application. So in this case, uh, we have a web URL. So the user, you know, install this application to the browser. They'll be taken straight to uh, straight to this URL. You can also tell it to launch it in a new tab, a new window, or a panel. Uh, and then after that, the user has the option to run it in full screen, which works really well for games. Um, but that's it. That's really all you have to do. You know, you've built these applications on the web. They're not specific to Chrome. You know, they're available in any browser. I mean, admittedly, this is a this is a Chrome-specific thing at the moment. Um, hopefully, we can uh, get other browsers to kind of up with the idea of installing web apps. Um, but yeah, this is all you have to do. It's not, not nothing amazing complex. Um, so once you've built your manifest, essentially, you include, actually I missed a section out, sorry. So we have names and descriptions and some basic metadata. We also have an icon section. That icon is essentially, the 128 pixel icon is this icon here. Um, all you need to do is include them inside the directory where the manifest file is, compress it, and then upload it to the store. So this is the application that we're gonna do. So this is a web application. It's a Basically, it's a to-do list. It's it's nothing amazing, but you know, uploads to the store. Just to show it does work. There we are. Uh, it's a web application. It's available on the web. You know, any modern browser can actually open this and use it. But I want to get this in the store, so it's it's actually super simple. So I show you how to do this now. So the actual, although the Chrome Web Store is not released yet, uh, you can actually upload your applications to the store. Uh, if you've ever uploaded the Chrome extension, it's the same interface. Um, so here we go. We'll go through the add new item. We'll choose a file. I've actually pre-prepared this, so we have a simple to do, which contains you know my manifest file, my images, uh, but also the zip file because it's just a bit easier. Uh, here's yeah, okay, so upload. All right, we're nearly done. We're nearly in the store. So we have a lot of options that we can do. We can. You know, we have the basic description, which is in the manifest, the version number, which is, the version number is actually really important because Chrome supports auto-synchronization of applications, and if you change your icon, you need to up update your uh, version number so that we can synchronize it with the rest of the clients who have installed your application. We also have the, the ability to change the pricing really easily, which was the screenshot before, uh, the categories. Um, but what I'm going to do is I'm just going to show you what the basic thing looks like before we actually publish it. So I'm going to choose two categories. We can only choose two categories. Um, the wording is a bit odd at the moment, and we can preview the changes now. If I publish this, it would pretty much work, um, but I, I'm not going to publish it just yet. Um, so this is actually the basic product landing page. This is what you get when you install, you install and update your manifest to the store. Um, you know, it doesn't look great at the moment. You know, there's a big white space here. This whole space here is for images, and I'm going to show you how to upload them in a minute. But we can modify quite a lot of this. So this whole section here, we can change the color from it. Uh, we can also put a really nice icon in. But you just kind of start to see some of the things that we can do with the store. So we have just here at the bottom, you know, user reviews and ratings. So if a user actually installs your application, they can go and you know, write a little review a little, and rate it as well. Uh, just works straight away. It's pretty cool. Um, that's not the greatest way. That's not the greatest kind of demo of uh, what you can do in the store. So I'm going to show you kind of how you can actually make it look better. Uh, so we're going to upload a big, nice icon. Uh, here we go. Oh, no, not that one. Rubbish one. I'm not the greatest artist, in the, by the way, so this probably looks a bit rubbish, but you know, I'm a developer. Uh, so, okay, so we've done that. So, if we were to preview this now, the icon would be present. But actually, what I want to do is I want to actually update a couple of things here. So, we're going to put a background image in just to make it look a little nicer. Uh, upload it. There we go. Uh, I need to say that I need to use it. Uh, it's white text because it's a black background, you can change the color of the text. Um, and here we go, let's preview some changes. So there we go, we've, we've updated quite a lot of it. Now we've got a nice icon. If I was great at art, I'd have something that you know, would look really cool. Um, 
but it looks a lot better than it did before. You know, it's customized. And the, the great thing is, if you're building an application, you want people to install it. You kind of want to stand out from the rest of the kind of developers out there. So definitely customize the kind of landing page. We can also add some nice screenshots in as well. Uh, so we choose a file. And the, the great thing is, if you've actually developed any extensions ever, this interface is it's, it's pretty much exactly the same. So we'll add a screenshot. There we go. Let's preview. There we are, cool. Uh, you can add quite a few screenshots in there. The really great thing is, and we encourage a lot of people to do this because we found this, that on extensions, if you upload a video and have you know, a video of you, know, you showing users how to use your application, we get really great install rates. If the same applies, you can put videos onto this and you know, users will be able to preview, preview that straight away. But there we go, if that's the basic listing, uh, it looks a lot better than it did before. And it gives, an, it gives the user an idea of what exactly happens in the application. Uh, we can also give a longer description as well. I can also target my application to, you know, if it was a check-only application, I could just say, you know, I only want this really to appear in the check store. Um, but yeah, you can put more information in. You've got 16,000 characters. The thing about the manifest, you've only got about 120 characters. And from the manifest, the, the, the data inside the manifest for the description, that's what actually appears in the search results of the web store. So you've got to be really, you know, really tight on what you do. You get a bit more room in this to actually you know, tell the user exactly what your application does. One of the really important things uh, is that we support, uh, I'd say this, does anyone use the Google Mac Webmaster Tools at all? Cool, quite a few people. So if you have any of your applications or your URLs registered with the Webmaster Tools, essentially that means you own that domain because you've proved that you, know, you can host files underneath it or you've added a C name to prove that you've owned the domain. Uh, we support the same thing in the web store. So essentially the web store allows me to associate a URL and it actually has to be the same URL that's in the manifest um, with, my, with my application. I'm gonna show you what it looks like actually because it's pretty important. So if you associate your application with um, something from the Google Webmaster Toolkit, your, your listing basically says this is verified. And this is a great way to kind of try and stop the phishing thing. So you know, if I was a bank um, and I put my application there and I didn't verify the domain, how would they know it's the bank and not some phishing site? Um, well, if you verify the domain, you've proven that you own the domain, which means that you get that. So users will be more confident about your application and you are who you say you are. Um, and that's probably one of the most important things about the store as well. Uh, but again, it's really simple. We're using, you know, reusing all the existing tools that we've got inside Google. And the last one I want to talk about uh, is, it, it, so we all use Google Analytics. We've got quite a lot of people. So but the really cool thing about this is, so the product landing page, I'm not going to put it in because I can't remember what my one is. But essentially, this is the product landing page that users will see when they come to install your application. You know, because it's a Google property, it's on the google.com domain essentially. And you know, how do you get the analytics and the information about how many people go to your application and how many people install the application from there? Well, you integrate analytics, so we have the option for you to just put your Google Analytics tracking account in there and you can see how successful your landing page is. You can see how successful changes are as well, so you can make changes to descriptions and the images and then track and see how well they do. But then you can also do things like, you know, see how well advertising campaigns go or you know, where all the sources, you know, if a blog does, you, does a review of your application and you don't know about it, you know, it'd be picked up straight away from Google, well, I suppose within 24 hours from Google Analytics. Um, and that's pretty much it from the store. Uh, I'll tell you what, I'll publish it. See how we go. Ah, I think it's the best file language. This is where it asks for about 10 different things that I haven't prepared. Uh, okay, so we'll publish. Okay, so basically this is saying you can publish your application now. Uh, it'll go in the store, but because the store's not available, only you will be able to see it, and we'll be able to see it. So, um, it's wrong as well, it says the extension, but my application is essentially published. Uh, I'll show you the install process, so I'll click install. It asks me, do I want to install it? If I have any extra permissions, because we can, we can also ask for like, things like unlimited storage and, and stuff like that with desktop applications, and you know, access to the geolocation APIs as well up front, it'll list them in there, but we're going to install it just for the sake of doing it. And that's what it looks like to the user when they come to install it. So it's a really, a really simple and easy way to actually install these applications. Um, so we're getting close to the end now, so it's pretty cool. Oh, iframes. Yeah, we are. So you, know, you integrate payment, and we sh I showed you the kind of screenshot before about the payments, the payment options. You know, it, you don't have to kind of integrate any payment processing systems in at all. It's no code. You can start taking payments straight away. 
But one of the things that you probably want to do is you probably just want to check if the user's actually paid for it. You know, you don't have to. We recommend you do. Um, and essentially, we support OpenID and OAuth. We have a licensed server. Uh, the user buys the application. Um, so yeah, the user buys the application. They get redirected to your site. They're actually logged in. They have an OpenID user ID, essentially, from our endpoint. And then you just combine that with the with the license server URL. It's one URL. Um, it's a REST-based request. And then you just basically use OAuth uh, to like sign your request. And then we just return an XML document or a JSON document that says, this user has paid for this application, or this user hasn't paid for this application. Um, and it's just a great way of actually you know, help, you know, helping you actually control access to your application from users who haven't paid. Uh, one thing I didn't talk about so much was we also support this notion of a trial as well. So you can actually let users like a premium kind of model use, install and use your application. Um, but you can detect that they're in trial mode. So if they say, I only want to try this application, we'll tell you that the user is in trial mode and you can choose to kind of limit the functionality from there. And that's kind of pretty much it now. So uh, kind, of, kind of wrapping up, the, the thing that I'm seeing in a lot of browsers at the moment, and it's kind of happening with IE9 and some of the stuff that Mozilla are doing, is that they kind of make an application the center of the user's web experience. And we're doing the same thing. So we saw this today where you, know, you install applications from the web store or from anywhere on the web if you want, uh, directly into the browser. And to the user, at least anyway, it appears like these are installed. But actually, the fact they're available on the web and just generally available. But they look like applications, they feel like applications because that's the way you're developing them, essentially. Um, yeah, <laughs> pretty much it. Uh, so, I have to say this now. There's, there's a lot of resource out there, so we probably mentioned it before. HTML5 Rocks is a site that we run uh, that helps you build everything that we've talked about today. So, if you want to make your application available offline, uh, and you want to use AppCache, or you want to use the Web SQL databases, HTML5 Rocks has got pretty much, it's got a load of tutorials that teach you how to do these things. Um, they're, very, they're relatively simple tutorials, so they're not kind of too in-depth, but they get me started as well. It tells you how to use 3D, I don't think it's got WebGL just yet. Uh, so CSS, 3D, and kind of all the advanced animation things that we were talking about today. If you want to kind of know how to build the Chrome app, I, say, I shouldn't say Chrome app actually, web app. <laughs> uh, it's code.google.com forward slash Chrome forward slash apps. And essentially, that just basically describes how you create the manifest file, because you've already made these web applications already hosted on the web. You just need to package it up with the manifest file, and that, that site tells you how to do it. Uh, and also, if you want to integrate with the payment processing APIs, or not the payment processing, the licensing API, uh, Chrome forward slash web store forward slash docs, uh, they'll give you all the information. Again, it's super simple. It's probably about 20 lines of Python code. Uh, if you're integrating with the App Engine and you use the federated ID, it's even simpler. Uh, but it's, it's really cool, it's really powerful. Um, we have one demo as well. So we have a developer from Spain, Gabby. Uh, he's going to come up and show you his web application uh, that they built. And then we'll take questions. I think we've got time for questions. Yeah, well, probably not actually. Um, we'll try to take as many questions as possible. Um, do you want to do it now? So we'll do one question now and then we can get the demo on. So. Yeah, so, uh, so the question was, are these applications installed into Chrome OS? Um, yes, because Chrome OS is Chrome. Um, the great thing about, uh, oh, no, sorry, sorry, no, do whatever you say, it's cool. Uh, the great thing about Chrome is that if you install an application on Chrome, you only see your desktop, and then you go to your laptop. Uh, we have a synchronization service which synchronizes all the extensions and apps across. And obviously these applications are built on the web anyway, so if you save the system data on the web, it just access them anywhere. It doesn't matter whether it's Chrome or Microsoft Chrome, because they're both Chrome. <laughs> However, that, that's, that's an interesting point because, you know, Android WebKit, your applications will still work. Uh, if, well, if you develop them correctly and you develop them for kind of mobile devices, you know, they should work. No. Um, so we've got a demo and then hopefully we can do some more questions after that as well. Hello, my name is John Sarras, and this is Eli Fiavi. 
and we are going to show now a real application that uses almost all the technologies you have seen during today and all the presentations in, in this room. So to see the demo of the application and to understand it, it's better first to know what CLV. So for that, I'm going to show you this slide. So CLV is a service that lets you to access all your files from any device you, you may have. So the idea is pretty easy. You install CLV in a laptop, in a desktop, or even in any Android device, and you can access all your files from, from, from those. From those. Uh, also, uh, we have a special device that is uh, an application for the ground, and this is the focus of the presentation. So let's get to the presentation of the application itself. So if you open a new tab, you will see the apps you have, as Paul was showing before. And in this case, we have here theory. So we click in, and we get directly into the application. This is because we are, we are already logged in in a Google account. So we are using OpenID to get the credentials of the user and, and, and open it. OK, so in this case, this user has the devices. It's a Chrome app, a laptop, and a Nexus One. So what we can do is to browse between the data of this user. Or, for instance, you can go for all. If you go to all, what you see here is all the data you have on all your devices. So not only on the Chrome, on the Chrome application itself. So you are navigating, navigating or browsing or, or your data. A best way to do it, for instance, is you can do a search, a fast, a fast search on all the data. Uh, let's look for flags. Whoops. For flags. Why is it it's so fast? This is so fast because of all this, applica this application. And let's see, it's really a, a, an HTML5 based application is using uh, storage, uh, storage from, from the Chrome itself. So it's using the HTML5 Web SQL database. We're using session storage, and we are using local storage to keep all this information also in the browser itself. So everything we have seen, we will be able to do it without having even connection to, to the server. But even for that, we have the favorites files that you can always access them even if you, if you don't have connection. For instance, we can play uh, a picture, or, you, or we can play uh, a video. Oh, sorry, I closed it. So that's a promotional video from Theory. Well, we cannot listen it because it's mute. Now we can listen. It's only a promotional video from Theory. And all this is playing inside the, inside the browser. The best way to see it is if, if we open the inspector of the browser. Probably some of you have been in the development tools session. You can see here in databases, we have our database and a bunch of tables we have to super all that. So this is a real a web, a web app, a Chrome app, let's say, that uses uh, the web SQL database to store all the information. So we can go, for instance, to the favorite file table, and we'll see all the records of our favorite files. Inspector is a very good tool, but sometimes it takes a bit to show information. So here it is. You can see this is the information of the of the files. Another cool feature of the application is that we can inter uh, interact with the, with the desktop. So we can uh, go to the desktop, look for uh, an image. I have several around here. They have changed. So but I'm looking for this one. OK? So that's a nice burger. A bit angry, no? So I can go back to the application and see that we can change all this all these to target the, the devices where, where I cannot load this image. For instance, I can transfer the image to, to my Android, or I can select the devices I want to transfer it to. Or I can also upload, oops, sorry, I lost the, the direct focus. So let me go back here. OK, here again. 
So I can drag the file to the application. So in this case, the picture is really loaded to the Chrome app device. It's not loading, it's here. Okay? You have to think that this picture has been really read from the application, so we are using, uh, so from the desktop, sorry, using the file API, uh, the file reader API, and we have sent using the common HX technologies to the server. We have seen all the metadata of this user and and get a uh, and get a, a preview of the picture to show it in, in here. Another capability of this application is to inter, uh, to extend the, the browser itself. If you go, for instance, uh, to a common, well-known site like Flickr, uh, I've been looking for Prag pictures, and one thing we can do, it's, if we like some of, or, or any of it, what we can do is to select one picture. Imagine that we have rights to get it, of course. If not, you can violate some, some level issues. So we get to have this extension that lets you to send this picture to the Android you have, or upload to the application itself. So we get another desktop interaction. We, met a, we got a notification that the file has been uploaded. So we can go back to the application. And if we go to the Chrome devices, OK, the image is being loaded. OK? So we have seen uh, two very good ways to upload files in the Chrome app to, to your system. So finally, to finalize and summarize the presentation, only explaining the capabilities we have seen and what technologies we have used. So for our offline capabilities, we have used the web all database, the session storage and the local storage, mainly to keep also what's the page you are currently uh, in. So when you get in, you always get to the same place. Also, desktop interaction using drag and drop API, the file API and notifications. Uh, all the view and show of the pictures and the videos is using pure HTML, so using the new tags of video and audio. Uh, browser extension, so we have seen an, a good sample of content script, this ability to upload files from the, from the browser. And finally, we have used rich user experience using mainly, well mainly no, using CSS3, uh, especially uh, wrong corners, multiple backgrounds to get all these effects with different, like with different, let's say, layers in the application, and also a lot of use of transitions. So you have to think that everything you have seen in this app is pure HTML5, CSS, and JavaScript. Nothing else in the in the app. So thank you very much. Is that on? Yeah, cool. Um, I only have like, I think probably 20 seconds for questions. So if, if you want to ask questions, it's probably best if we do it outside. And I'm available to ask, answer anything that you want. So we've run a little bit over and there's another presentation on now. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you for your time and I hope you can develop some great web apps.